So we are on an adventure in spirituality. We are discussing Embracing Uncertainty, the book by Susan Jeffers, Breakthrough Methods for Achieving Peace of Mind When Facing the Unknown. So this exploration today is from the chapter titled Freedom from Our Attachment to Unhappiness. Do you think that you have attachment to unhappiness? Have you thought about that lately? Do I have attachment to unhappiness? Well, one of the spiritual ideas is that if you have some unhappiness, you probably have some attachment to unhappiness. <laughs> and I think we all have some unhappiness, don't we? Give a wave, do a post. If you have some areas in your life, in your mind, in the world where you have some unhappiness, where you have some discontent. So we're going to explore that idea today. Last week, we explored the power of maybe, the value of doubt, realizing that there's not much that we know for certain, that we are truly, truly certain of, and also exploring the idea uh, that we might not even know whether or not something is good or something is bad. That in fact, in time that can shift and with new experience, our judgments on whether something is good or bad can shift. This week, we're talking about expectations. Susan Jeffers says, the prime cause of our suffering is, I'm not gonna finish that quote. I'm gonna leave you an expectation. How does that feel? The prime cause of our suffering is, we don't have Todd to give us our drum roll. The prime cause of our suffering is, on to the next thing. I have a friend who was working this week and at his place of employment, a man came up to him who needed help with something. And he noticed the man had a, a, a fun accent and the man went around, did his shopping and then came back by later on in his shopping trip. And as he came up to my friend, my friend said, so tell me, where are you from? Your accent is, is so unique. Is it, you know, Swedish? Where, where is it? Where are you from? And the man proceeded to tell this story. He was in his early 60s and he had a stroke that was caused by a medication that he had had um, to deal with some issue that he got in the military. And so with this medication, a stroke ended up occurring and he was in a coma for about 33 days. And 33 days in a coma, nine years ago, and when he came out of the coma on the 33rd day, he did not have all of his faculties, right? You've heard this about sometimes when folks have a stroke, they have to relearn things. So he had to relearn a lot of things. And one of the things that happened was that he could not talk. He could not get his language back. And then out of nowhere, one day he began speaking again. And he began speaking in a Swedish accent. A slow type of speaking, but his speech had a Swedish accent. And he said to my friend, but I'm not from Europe. I'm not, I'm from here. I'm from Indiana. Now I'm from Indiana and I know people from Indiana don't sound like they have a Swedish accent. And he said, I'm from Indiana. I had this stroke and when I came back, I had an accent and it, it, it was how I sounded. And he said, he said that one of the, um, one of his family members, I think a niece or something like that, uh, started saying, don't talk like that. What's wrong? Oh my gosh, you're talking like this. And the nurses said, no, 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 no. Don't put any expectations on it. The fact that he's talking is amazing. Just encourage him to speak. Don't be attached to him sounding like the good old Indiana boy he was before. Nine years now later, and he still has the accent. He told my friend, he said, Google people that um, come out of coma speaking different languages. Regardless, he goes on to tell the story that he had been in the military and traveled a lot for work. And, and he eventually went back after the stroke, he went back to Thailand, one of his favorite places to visit. And he said, before this period in his life, 
women weren't, were you know, he didn't have much attention for women, uh, from women. And um, he was not married. And he, he just said, they just didn't mind me. They just didn't, um, didn't come up to me, didn't, didn't talk to me. But with this new accent, a woman was quite attracted to the accent. And he met this wonderful Thai woman. They ended up getting married. They live in the United States. And there he was at my friend's place of employment, buying spices and herbs to um, bring home to her so that she could cook dinner, a great Thai dinner. So I tell that story to tie in last week to this week. Is it bad? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it good? He had always wanted love in his life. He felt like he never really got attention. And the one thing that was the failed expectation in life, I will have my health. You know, who has in their list of expectations to get a stroke and to lose all your faculties and have to relearn everything and to live in the middle of the Midwest with a Swedish accent? Yet, that brought him one of the most sacred experiences in his life. It brought him his beloved. It brought him the love of his life, which is a true joy. He also said on a side note that he got offered a job for an intelligence agency translating because the accent that he has can't be detected by all of the um you know, the programs that can listen to you when you have messages or when we're talking right here and it can say, okay, this is what it said. And it can search for keywords and accents. Well, his accent is non-detectable. So, so anyway, that was a side note that I thought was truly fascinating. There's some more things to, to look, to look, look for in those stories. Um, and I'm sure you have many things coming to your mind about why he might have had that accent and where he would have gotten it from. But he said, Google, I, Google stories about people who show up um, speaking a different language after they have been in a coma. And I thought that was just fascinating. He said some actually speak in entirely different languages that they, they never, um, you know, really knew before, before getting, getting injured. So expectation, maybe uncertainty. Is it good? Is it bad? Oh, how would we live if we didn't have expectations? How would we live if we didn't have attachments to expectations? Imagine if this man had stopped living because of all of the disappointments, all of the attachment that he had to life being a certain way, to his physical health being a certain way, to his story being a certain way. What if he had just brought himself down with all of that rather than lift himself up and keep engaging life. Are you harboring expectations? Am I harboring expectations? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe that it is part of the human condition to naturally have expectations. It's what our brains do. And in fact, we are taught, look at the film industry. Boy, are we taught to have expectations. We are taught to have expectations beyond what is generally even possible. We're taught to have expectations about our body and how it looks. We're taught to have expectations about relationships, about um, um, aging, about, about everything we're programmed to have expectations. So it's a great spiritual practice to question the importance and the necessity of expectations. Now, Susan Jeffers explores letting go of expectations and she also explores the idea of non-attachment. In my personal experience, I have been more successful with non-attachment than I have been at letting go of expectations. I do believe it's possible. And I've had times in my life, certainly during the Lent practice, where we take 40 days in unity to engage in a change of mind, a change in thinking, where we live and embody a new thought. And that takes a vigilant awareness of the mind, right? But um, in general day-to-day -day life, I feel like expectations begin to come even when I'm in deep meditative spaces in life, really trying to presence something and presence my mind. Expectations just keep popping up. The mind does what the mind does. But what is more accessible to me is the practice of non-attachment. 
So when the expectations come, I see them, but I don't have to hold on to them. I don't have to make them real. I don't have to buy into the idea that if they're fulfilled, it's good. If they're not fulfilled, it's bad. I can question that idea. In fact, I have been known in interviews to do something a little bit non-traditional. I know a lot of people who go strong hearted and strong armed into any interview. This is mine. I've got it. They have their affirmations. I will have this. They begin telling people, this is my job. I'm a little different. I went into my interview here at Unity Village Chapel with every step immersed in prayer and immersed in this intention. If it is mine, let it be clear and let nothing stand in the way if it is mine to do. If it is not mine, let all of my energy and power be directed to the highest and best for this spiritual community. And I trust that process, period. So when they asked me to do the closing prayer, it might have seemed a little interesting that in that I blessed their next spiritual leader. And I shared in that prayer the vision that if it is mine to do, let us all be clear that it is mine to do. And that if it is someone else's divine appointment, whatever is the highest and the best for one is the highest and the best for all then may we all intuit and bring that in together. I did a similar thing when I was at Unity of Montclair. And on the surface, these ideas could seem like having a lack of confidence. Can you see that? Sometimes we're criticized for not being so intentional, so on purpose, so mm, grounded in what we want. It can look like we just don't have confidence in ourselves. But in fact, I have confidence in something greater. And the self within me that is greater than the self that just operates in my mind and thinks it might know what's best for anything. When I was interviewing for Unity of Montclair, I remember specifically driving back from dinner in the car between two beloveds in the back seat. And we were all having this lively conversation because I was, I was so energized by my time in the interview and my time with the people in the spiritual community there. I was so energized and they were feeling that same energy. They were excited. They were feeling connected and they were, um, kind of leaning into the space of going like, we're really excited about you. Like, we're not going to say anything right now. I mean, we can't say anything this second, but actually I think maybe they did. I think they made maybe offered it to me right, right at the end of everything. So we're sitting in the back of the car and, and this community, this community in Montclair is, oh, such a sacred community. And it has such powerhouses in that area in New York, New Jersey. Eric Butterworth taught for years and years and years. And so people from Jersey would drive into the city to see him. He would also have these summer camps, these summer learning camps. Bless you, Eric Butterworth. And he would gather people together throughout the area and they would learn together. They would explore together. So it is, a, it is an area rich with unity teachings. It's also an area rich with diversity. I got to experience the town of Montclair and it was like for me being in a space that I had not seen demonstrated before as far as diversity and as far as a unity community the diversity there was just incredible it was so rich and in fact I attribute a lot of my style to them I attribute a lot of my um, boldness as far as uh, getting encouragement when I engage in talks and using my hands and, and, and being alive because it was such a full community experience. But the diversity was a piece that I thought was so valuable. So I remember leaning over to them in the car and saying, I'm feeling this, but here's the thing. This spiritual community is I would say over half African-American and the other half very diverse as well. And I said, maybe not as far as age. That was the only thing that it didn't have diversity in age, <laughs> but that came later, that came after I got there. 
um, with rock stars showing up. But I said, the diversity here is what I have heard people in the unity movement talking about forever as an ideal, as what we would love to see. And I don't know if me, my being, you know, I think I said like a little white girl or something like that <laughs> is going to change that and shift that. And what you have is so precious. I can help you find an incredible African-American minister to serve this spiritual community. I have some amazing friends. And if anyone knew what was right here at Unity of Montclair, I think they would all be rushing here. But I can find you an amazing black minister. And you know the response? It was a little bit like, thanks, thanks, thanks. What we are looking for is consciousness and you've got it. And I was humbled by that. But I tell that story to show that there is another way to live and to act and to be that is not so attached all the time. And you will not risk giving things up. There are a few things that I stand on very, very strongly that I say, look into my eyes and trust me, you will not miss a thing that is yours. If you say this or something better, if you lift it up to the highest and best, if you pray for everybody's highest interest, and if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if it is your way or your will or your idea. And that is the best that it will be. And if not, it is so safe. It is so safe to say, redirect me. The problem with attachment to expectations is the energy of disappointment, discontent, concern and worry that we often stay saturated in instead of living in the joy, the awe and the contentment that is available to us in life. We put ourselves into a mind bind. We become so hell bent on something happening that we live in hell and we create hell. When heaven is available, accessible, and even chasing us. Consider that for a moment. Heaven is chasing you. Heaven consciousness is always right there, knocking at your door, saying, can I come in? Are you gonna open it? Are you gonna open it? Are you expectations. I want to share a couple of passages from Susan Jeffers about expectations. She says, expectations rule our emotions, our judgments, and sometimes our actions. They carry with them disappointment, rigidity, anger, impatience, and obsession. Raise your hand if you want to say, give me some more. Give me some more of that. Come on, give me some more of that. She also says expectations create within our being an intense need to control everything and everyone in the outside world. I know a couple of Unity Minister friends would, that would say, have fun with that. Have fun with that. The weather, our boss, our children, our love life, and so on. She says, as I've already discussed, not only is the future uncontrollable, most people and events in the outside world are also uncontrollable. Instead of letting go of trying to do the impossible, what do we do? We try harder. A little bit more self-sabotage, I'd say. Now, the misunderstanding is that this idea of having non-attachment means that we would take actions differently. That's not what it means. 
It doesn't mean that we wouldn't still have visions. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't still have ideas. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't still pray. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't still hold the space for what we intuit and what our heart's desire is. It doesn't mean that. It just means that we would come from a different place. She says this. Taking action without worry ensures a clearer mind that allows you to get things done intelligently instead of emotionally. Taking action without worry allows you to do the very best you can. She says it just means you are not going to worry about the outcome. It doesn't mean you show up differently. Uh, well, as far as your actions, you show up differently as far as your beingness, your presentness in the moment. She goes on to say the actions you take when attached to an outcome are here. The actions you take when you're not attached to an outcome are here. What's optional is all the garbage we put ourselves through in the meantime. That's what's optional. Are we going to keep eating from what is optional and ordinary? Or are we going to start feasting on what is extraordinary and what is divine? She said the critical difference is how we experience things. We get to have an emotional change, a state of change in our emotional being. And that change is really a state of being in the flow, being open and peaceful and accepting of what is. I really think that one way of being looks like fear and the other looks like faith. And if we dive even more deeply into unity principles, we understand that when we talk about the law of mind action, we're not just talking about our affirmations, our visions, our prayers, our thoughts. We're talking about how we feel and whether or not our feeling nature, whether or not our emotional nature, whether or not the consciousness that we create, the field, the vibration, however you want to say it, whether or not what we are visioning can come through that. So if we are constricted, if we are attached, we've all had experiences where we have attachments to something and we don't see the other things that are available to us. Scripture refers to that. Anyone else here have an experience? of what Susan Jeffers talks about when she says that she self-sabotages sometimes, worrying, being a great worrier and moving into possibilities. And if things go this way, well, then these are all the things that could go wrong. And if things go this way, then these are all the things that could go wrong. And she finds herself sometimes stuck in the middle, right? Anyone else have that? Raise your hand if you did. Pick me, pick me. I have a master's degree in that. I have a master's degree in looking at every outcome and finding what could be wrong with it. But if this, then X, Y, Z, but if that, then X, Y, Z. And I developed through some very challenging experiences and through some support of some amazing friends, how to watch my mind when it does that. So that I can see when I am stuck between a rock and a hard place. When I was on the journey of having my daughter, I remember talking to an incredible girlfriend that I have and it wasn't just once that she listened to me borrow trouble. It wasn't just once that she heard me say my worries about if this are, my worries about if that are. And I was going, well, if I can't, then this. And, but if I can, then this. 
And then, but what about this when this, and how is that going to go? And what if when this happens and that happens and oh, how am I going to this? And how am I going to that? And what she finally started saying to me, which then became a mantra that I said to myself, is she said, that would be a good problem to have, Aaron. That would be a good problem to have. This thing that I'm saying is a problem, could be a problem, it will be a problem. But look at all these things that could be a really big problem. And she said, that would be a good problem to have. Why, I said, because that means she's here. Are we ready to lift ourselves out of the caves of impossibility we hide in with the toxic or unhelpful thinking of our minds. I want to share with you, and I really want to read half the book, but we don't have time for that today. So I'll tell you what pages this is on and you can read it yourself. But I got the first story and then I was like, I got to share the second story too. But one of my favorite resource books for pulling myself up by the bootstraps is A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. This is from page 198 and 199. It's called Not Minding What Happens. Not Minding What Happens. Krishnamurti, the great Indian philosopher and spiritual teacher, spoke and traveled almost continuously all over the world for more than 50 years, attempting to convey through words which are content that which is beyond words, beyond content. At one of his talks in the latter part of his life, he surprised his audience by asking, do you wanna know my secret? Everyone became alert. Many people in the audience had been coming to listen to him for 20 or 30 years and still failed to grasp the essence of his teaching. Finally, after all these years, the master would give them the key to understanding. Drum roll, please. I'm not going to finish it. I'll, I'll see you next Sunday. Just kidding. This is my secret. He said, I don't mind what happens. I don't mind what happens. Eckhart Tolle goes on to say, when I don't mind what happens, what does that imply? It implies that internally I am in alignment with what happens. What happens, of course, refers to the suchness of this moment, which is already as it is. Get that? It's already as it is. It's already as it is. How futile to try to argue with what is already as it is. Again, not about future actions, intentions, visions, prayers. It refers to content, the form that this moment, the only moment that ever is, takes. To be in alignment with what is means to be in a relationship of inner non-resistance with what happens. It means not to label it mentally as good or bad, but to let it be. Does this mean that you can no longer take action to bring about a change in your life? On the contrary, hear this. When the basis for your actions is inner alignment with the present moment, your actions become empowered by the intelligence of life itself. I really want to share the next story. Since none of you can tell me to stop in person, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> All right, here we are. This is about a Zen master. 
the Zen master Hakin lived in a town in Japan. He was held in high regard and many people came to him for spiritual teachings. Then it happened that a teenage daughter of his next door neighbor became pregnant. When being questioned by her angry and scolding parents as to the identity of the father, she told them that he was Hakim, the Zen master. In great anger, the parents rushed over to him and told him with much shouting and accusing that their daughter had confessed that he was the father. All he replied was, is that so? News of the scandal spread throughout the town and beyond. The master lost his reputation. This did not trouble him. Nobody came to see him anymore. He remained unmoved. When the child was born, the parents brought the baby to Hakim. You are the father, so you look after him. The master took loving care of the child. A year later, the mother remorsefully confessed to her parents that the real father of the child was the young man who worked in the butcher shop. In great distress, they went to see the master to apologize and ask for forgiveness. We are really sorry. We have come to take the baby back. Our daughter confessed that you are not the father. Is that so? Is all he would say as he handed the baby over to them. The master responds to falsehood and truth, bad news and good news in exactly the same way. Is that so? He allows the form of the moment, good or bad, to be as it is and so does not become a participant in human drama. We could use some of this right now, right? How do you opt out of being a participant in human drama? He goes on to say to him, there is only this moment and this moment is as it is. Events are not personalized. He is nobody's victim. He is so completely at one with what happens with that. He is so completely at one with what happens that what happens has no power over him anymore. Only if you resist what happens, are you at the mercy of what happens and the world will determine your happiness or unhappiness. The world will determine your happiness or unhappiness. The closing sentence says, imagine briefly how the ego would have reacted during the various stages of unfolding of these events. How do you think you would react during those events? How are you reacting? during the events we're experiencing right now. Invitations, always invitations. He says, the most important, the primordial relationship in your life is your relationship with the now, or rather with whatever form the now takes. That is to say, what is, or what happens. If your relationship with the now is dysfunctional, that dysfunctional dysfunction will be reflected in every relationship and every situation you encounter. See, worry is not personal. Worry, we think when we go down those roads, when we go down attachment and expectation, we think it's about certain situations, right? We think it's about certain outcomes. We think it's about real problems but it is just what the mind does. It's just a pattern paved in the mind and the mind will do what the mind does. But presence and awareness can do what presence and awareness does. Susan Jeffers says, expectations keep us from noticing and playing with the exciting possibilities that always surround us. I mean, look, he got a baby for a year. How fun is that? And that baby got a Zen master for a year. How cool is that? Bet he didn't think that was gonna happen. Oh, he probably didn't have any expectations, excuse me. Eckert says, 
Oh, no. Susan Jeffers says, as long as we insist that things have to be a certain way, we limit our vision. When we let go of our expectations, we live with a greater sense of creativity, curiosity, and possibility. We understand that life is huge, she said. So what are our tools? Let's look at our tools. Here they are. Our tools are these that she gives us. Worry tomorrow, she says. Every time you feel yourself starting to worry, just decide to worry tomorrow. Put it off a day. Think about it for a second and set it aside. You can even write yourself a note. Worry tomorrow. Watch for your professional worrier. Watch for attachments. Watch the mind trail that is paved in the insatiable desire to have expectations that will lead to attachments that will lead to suffering. It's all just one problem. It's not a whole bunch of things. It's just one issue. And leave it until tomorrow. The second tool, notice your upset. Become the observer. She gives us this statement. What am I holding on to that is causing this upset? What am I holding on to that is causing this upset? For me personally, and I invite you to write this in your own words that match how your mind works and processes. For me, it sounds something like this. What am I wishing was different than what is? What am I wishing that is different from what is? How am I wishing this moment or this person or this situation was different than it is right now? Now, remember again, the clarification is that doesn't mean I'm not going to have visions, actions, prayers, launch powerhouse energies towards the direction of light and harmony and peace and grace and all of these things, God. but I'm not gonna be miserable in the midst of it. I'm gonna be the flow. I'm gonna open my heart, my being, so that my energy field, so that my emotional field is more likely to match what I would like to be drawing in. Notice the upset. And if you need to, tell yourself, that would be a good problem to have. That can apply to almost anything. If you feel pain in your body, oh, my leg hurts. Ah, that's a good problem to have. It means I have a leg. Oh, this is disappointing or this relationship, it hurts. Whatever it is, oh, it's a good problem to have. That means love is here. I was even in a, a conference call with the Reverend Paul Hasselback, one of Unity's um, instructors for spiritual education and he shared his latest epiphany on fear versus love and he said he really got in this last bit of time here in the human condition that fear is not the opposite of love that in fact when we experience fear it is a love in disguise he didn't say it like that but it's love in disguise in that it's like ask yourself when you're having fear what is it that I'm loving so much that this is bringing me fear? So when we're in fear, we can even say, ah, it's a good problem to have. Let me get in touch with what I am loving, what I hold dear, what I value, and move into that field of energy, that field of vibration. She reminds us to do our best to let go and not to should on ourselves. She says that hindsight is to educate us, not to upset us. The prime cause of our suffering, the prime cause of our suffering, she says, is wanting things to be different than they are. Wanting things to be different than they are. So turn on the light, allow in the light. Be willing to release expectations and release attachments 
to live a life of peace and harmony that will most doubtedly more, be more likely to bring in the peace and the harmony that we are seeking. I close with these words. Susan Jeffers says, if you knew you could find happiness in whatever state you find yourself in, ill health or good health, rich or poor, in a great relationship or not, and so on, then your worry about the uncertainty in your life would be greatly diminished. Know that you can find peace. Know that we can find happiness. Know that we can be grounded in whatever state we find ourselves in. Namaste.